I'm going to talk a little bit this morning about Dementia Informed Victoria, which is an initi initiative I've been working on. And it's really about celebrating the potential of living well, living a good life, even if you have memory loss, which I think is entirely possible if you have supports, if you have a caring community. Um, there are so many fears around dementia. Um, and I think it's because so often we, we see people talking or sharing things. I just wrote an editorial that was published in the Toronto Star this past week um, about dementia and about some of the images on TikTok that are so disrespectful that are demeaning um, and, and posted without clearly the person with memory losses um, consent because they can't consent and people are letting off their attention, but it's just so inappropriate and I'm hoping it brings some attention to this. And it's not that it'll stop social media, but that people recognize that this is not helpful. It's not right. It's not moral. Um, so I'm segueing a little bit, but today I thought I'd talk a little bit about why dementia is, why my focus has been on dementia. Um, talk a little bit about some dementia informed approaches. I like the word informed rather than dementia friendly because it seems a little more respectful. Like we talk about child friendly. Um, I think dementia informed helps focus us on the fact that we want to approach dementia in a way that is respectful, that is supportive, and talk about some programs I've been involved in, and then talk about sort of next steps. And I'm looking forward to having a bit of a conversation with you afterwards, some questions, hopefully, and, and sharing, um, sharing some things that, some examples of some of the things I've been doing. Um, Okay, so a little background. You all know that the prevalence of dementia is increasing. It's gonna double in the next nine years um, to nearly a million. Um, people with dementia face a particularly high risk for stigma and social isolation. People get diagnosed late because they're afraid of being diagnosed. They know they'll be treated differently. One of my neighbors was just diagnosed with vascular dementia. There are many causes of dementia and I think the public sometimes doesn't realize that. You know, tend to think it's always Alzheimer's disease. So stigma and social isolation really impact people's health, the quality of life. Both care partners and persons living with dementia are affected by dementia um, because of the ways in which our community is not set up to, to support people. There's no medical cure expected soon for dementia, although efforts definitely are more skewed towards trying to find, understand the biological mechanisms, and that's all well and good. But right now, you know, the pharmaceuticals just allow people to function better for a year or two with dementia. They don't change the disease process. And what's really needed are approaches that help people stay connected in their communities, that recognize that dementia is not what defines someone as a person, to create a sense of community through inclusive and meaningful activities. You know, when I look at dementia villages, my first question is great that you've got this environment um, when people do need um, long-term care that allows, that's more home-like, that's more like the greenhouses that Bill Thomas has advocated for. But are there meaningful activities? Are there things that, you know, this idea of, um, of truth, like I don't want to live in a, a Truman show, um, those of you that have seen the movie, um, I want to live, if I had dementia, I would want to live in a way that was honest and had integrity and involved truth, and also allowed me to continue to participate in things that I enjoyed, whether it be Scrabble, whether it be um, singing, or maybe doing art, painting, or learning things. No matter what state of life we're in, we, we still want to feel that we can contribute in some way, that we can learn new things, and um, that what we're doing matters. Um, in 2017, there was a report on Canadian dementia priority setting, and this is what led to, the, to Canada's national dementia strategy that's being implemented by um, the Public Health Agency of Canada, sometimes referred to as PHAC. Um, the dementia research priorities that were identified after bringing together um, the, this priority setting asked Canadians affected by dementia and care providers and families about what they believe were the most important research questions. And the ones that I've really focused on in the work that I'm doing are addressing stigma, emotional well-being, caregiver support, and dementia-friendly communities. 
Um, but just so you can kind of see what this is, this is what people with dementia really value um, and their caregivers and the healthcare providers as well. And so how do we help actualize this in, and make it into, help make Canada into the kind of place that we want to live in if we have dementia? I always think of John Rawls. He was a really important philosopher. My um, husband taught in philosophy for about 37 years. And, and so I think that's why I'm particularly sensitive to philosophical perspectives. But he asked, you know, what kind of place would you want to, what kind of world would you want to live in where if you were the worst off in that world, that would be acceptable. And um, it's something we can think of with dementia too. Like what kind of world where if we had dementia, would it be acceptable? Um, the kinds of supports that are in place. And that brings us up to a, a, you know, a basic level of support. Um, we've recently, only recently, have we really come to realize like the impacts of social isolation and loneliness on health and to really appreciate that. Social isolation increases your risk of premature death, mortality. Um, it's a risk that rivals those, that of smoking and obesity and physical activity. I mean, being lonely is equivalent to smoking like 15 cigarettes a day and sitting on the couch all day. <laughs> it's incredible. I don't think we realized the impact until recently. It's also associated with a 50% increased risk of dementia. So social isolation has been the focus of a lot of attention recently. In fact, in the UK, there's a minister of loneliness. Loneliness is caused by, you know, it's multifaceted. It's complex. It's not like you can just... Uh, address it easily, of course, and that's why it's a, a social problem. Um, many people become socially, and social isolation is a perception. Um, uh, it's, it's, I'm sorry, I'm not saying that quite right. Social isolation is, you know, the extent to which someone is connected within their social, uh, their social area. Um, Poor social relationships are associated with a 29% increase in heart risk, a 32% increase in risk. People who are lonely have higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. Loneliness among heart failure patients had nearly a four times increased risk of death. So you can see here, it increases hospitalization, it increases emergency departments. This is partly why it's gotten such significant attention because it's increasing healthcare costs and it's often costs that bring attention to an issue. The important thing here, though, is that people with dementia are at significant, really higher risks of loneliness and social isolation because of the stigma, because of the, the stereotypes around dementia that perpetuate um, fears and, um, and um, <clears throat> you know, this, this sense of, um, of, of, like, the worst possible case is, is what people with dementia have. Um, I've been trying to develop dementia-informed approaches, and I'm trying to create really a dementia-informed movement that I'm calling um, Momentia Victoria, where people have more opportunities with dementia to stay engaged in their communities. There have been a number of dementia-informed approaches, I would call it. Lately, there's, from the University of Toronto, there's been a movement called Reimagining Dementia, which is a creative coalition for justice, and <clears throat> this is a wonderful group of people who are sharing a more diverse and humanizing um, vision of care and support that focuses on inclusion, relationality, we are social beings, creativity, that even with memory loss, you can have creativity and imagination that can make life joyful. Um, the possibility of growth that even with memory loss, and I think this is what um, one of the, what I'm trying to show as well, you can still learn new things and it's not the defining um, characteristic of you. Um, so reimagining dementia is a wonderful group to get involved with and they're mobilizing and trying to create a movement to, to spread and share some of the values that will make life good for those who do have dementia and create environments in which, regardless of what your disability is, whether it's cognitive or physical, that everyone is supported to thrive and to grow. Um, another group I wanted to mention is Dementia Advocacy Canada, which is doing some very good work over the past two years. Um, they have a lot of people, a lot of people with dementia are becoming advocates for themselves. 
which is wonderful because we need to have their voice. What is it that really matters? So they're participating in policies and studies, they're educating, they're informing, and they're trying to shift perspectives that if you have dementia, that, that you don't have something that you aren't able to articulate your own needs. Um, it's done this with no budget really at, and relied entirely on volunteer support, which goes to show that, you know, people really can make a difference and help shape their own care. And I'm so glad to see these voices coming into, into um, the work that's happening in the area of dementia. Okay, the Voices in Motion Choirs is a choir I started. Um, I had this idea, my dad had dementia and had nothing to do and loved music. And a friend of mine had started a, inner, a choir program for people with memory loss in, in Minnesota. It was called Giving Voice because they were giving people with dementia a voice and their care partners. Um, anyway, my little addition to this choir idea was that we would make it intergenerational. I thought I've worked with intergenerational programs before. I think they're, it's amazing to try to bridge between generations because we typically hang out with people in our own age groups and we're siloed age wise. Um, how many of you know, if you're in your sixties, how many of you know, young adults who aren't your grandchildren, <laughs> um, you know, when we think about it, we don't get that many opportunities to connect with generations. So I wanted to create an intergenerational choir program. I wanted it not to be a sing-along, but professionally conducted. I think that's, we wanted a high quality arts program in which the focus wasn't on dementia per se, although it was dementia informed, dementia inclusive, but in which the focus was on the art, the choir, the music that would be created. Um, we were fortunate to get a grant from the Alzheimer's Society of Canada, and we conducted probably one of the most rigorous studies on choirs that's been conducted to date. Um, we gather data every month on our participants, and, um, and after, the, after the study ended, we were fortunate that we were able to turn the choir into a charity, and it's made it through the pandemic, and there's currently three in-person community-based choirs and one online choir. Um, The choir program, just so you know a little bit about it, was a 12-week season, and it would always conclude with a concert performance. Um, we had weekly 60 to 90-minute rehearsals in person because this was pre-pandemic. There were three-part harmonies. People had music binders that were geared towards lyrics only or for those who could read music, a full score. And we gave people CDs to listen and practice at home and ultimately shifted to YouTubes that allowed them to practice as well. So care partners had an opportunity to, you know, engage at home as well. Um, each season was, was organized around a particular theme like songs of love and friendship or living in technicolor or people who need people. We have popular songs from a lot of eras, not just old songs, but new songs. Um, but I give you a few examples here. Yellow Submarine, What a Wonderful World. Um, the So Happy Together theme was, um, a concert that we gave this last winter. And we had songs like, That's What Friends Are For. Um, and I think, you know, these songs, younger people got to learn about, they got to hear stories. Like when we were learning um, The White Cliffs of Dover, they, people talked about, the students got to hear firsthand from some of the folks who lived through World War II, you know, what the, the song White Cliffs of Dover meant to them and why it was an important song. Um, as important as the music was, was also the social elements of the choir, like having time to talk, having some refreshments at the end of the choir where people could linger. And we had to teach the students how to interact with the older adults um, as well. Um, we gave them questions so that they became more comfortable communicating. Um, when the older adults arrived, we asked them to you know, walk up and take their um, coat and sit down with them and get their notebook and just kind of easing those social interactions because the students didn't, the high school students really weren't quite sure initially what to do. And they tended to cluster because there was a little bit of anxiety. Um, so we were trying to create a community and create opportunities for friendships um, and interactions as well. We ended up over the two years having 35, um, we called them duets rather than dyads because they were care partners and persons with memory loss. We like the idea of duets. 
Um, the care partners typically were spouses. They were about 69 years old on average. People with dementia were around 80 years old. Um, half of our members were spouses, 30% were the adult children. We had both, it was a mixed method study um, and it was a repeated measure. So again, as I mentioned, every month we asked a lot of our caregivers, care partners to come in every month for these very detailed assessments um, that included gait and cognition and a lot of measures people really don't enjoy doing. But we had very low attrition and they were so engaged in the choir and eager to help advance um, what we know about the impact of choirs um, on key outcomes. So what we found was that caregiver distress was significantly decreased during the choir season. We had a, a perfect study design. It started in January and then we had the summer break and then we started again in the fall. And what we saw is that caregiver distress rose during that summer break and then it decreased again in the fall. Now, interestingly, it didn't decrease as much in the fall. And I think that's because dementia progresses over time and caregiver care partner distress um, naturally increases as it, there are more um, needs required of them. Um, rates of depression for persons, care partners and persons living with dementia also decreased. And what was most exciting, and we have a paper coming out on this, was that the annual rates of decline, cognitive decline, for the person with dementia was about half what would have been expected based on national data. Like this is huge. And it's not that we're changing like the course of dementia. That's not it. You know, we can't stop the disease process. It shows that when you provide people with a setting in which you have less stress, in which they feel care, they're in a caring community, they can't do anything wrong, that they function better. And we all know that when we have depression or when we're stressed, um, you know, when we're in situations that create anxiety that we're not going to be able to function as well. And so when you think about the impact of stigma on people with dementia, they're not functioning as well as they can because they're so tensed up about what could possibly go wrong or, you know, what if I can't remember that? Um, we also gathered qualitative data and the qualitative data really pointed to the fact that the choir increased quality of life, helped people to have a sense of real well-being we were able to shift um, stigma, especially among students who felt previously a lot of anxiety around dementia. Um, and, uh, and we saw more empathy and understanding, particularly among the students. Um, we shifted dementia among the public because we had public concerts where people could not tell who had dementia and who, had, who was just one of the, the care partners, um, people, were equals in the choir for the most part. Some people needed a little more support with their music, um, but they really gained an identity as well as a singer. Um, the choir brought a lot of positive emotions. It also tapped into a lot of memories that people perhaps hadn't thought of in a while, and they had stories to share. And that again was a way of valuing um, their life and who they are as a person that you are not your dementia, that's not the defining characteristic. So a whole community developed, and I just wanted to share some of the qualitative findings that um, people had this real sense of belonging, but also the fact that it was a professionally directed choir. So one participant said, this is not campfire singing. We do a reasonable job. The absolute delight is hearing other voices and hearing where you fit in. So under, you know, feeling that they could really contribute and sing in harmony. Um, the sense of community was huge that developed, and um, we found that we had to keep different activities going across the year. If we had breaks, we would try to do like a tailgate party, particularly during COVID, where we'd meet in a, um, a parking lot, and people would bring chairs and be socially distanced, but be able to see each other and sing a little bit. Um, anyway, students were typically partnered a bit with someone with memory loss so that the care partner um, could sit in the section that they belong because, you know, if it's a husband, wife, one's often a soprano and the other's maybe a tenor. Um, so the students were there to offer support and get to know the individual. Then we had ice breaks for sharing personal stories. We would bring someone up to talk about a song or talk about their favorite food, even just little things that gave people things to talk about after we finished singing, you know, like, oh, you know, your favorite food's Italian, so's mine, etc. Um, there were a number of close friendships that developed among choristers, also among students. 
I've had a number of students that have gone on to careers in gerontology now five years out. Um, some of those students are at UVic, one's applied to um, medical school, another became a nurse, and very interested in working with older adults because of their experiences in the choir. Um, so close friendships um, developed in many cases. And so the stigma, just to share with you a few of the student views, um, one student said in the beginning, you're always thinking in the bottom of your head, they have Alzheimer's, so you have to be careful. But as weeks progressed, you start to forget they have Alzheimer's. And like the beginning of rehearsals, you're like, oh, hey, come sit with me. And you start chatting with them and it's comfortable. Um, and you can see this other, other quote over here, um, a sense of purpose and shifting views. Um, the fact that you're coming, that you're on stage performing, people come to hear you sing. Um, and it's good. It's, yeah, great to be out in the world. Um, okay, I'm just going to share with you, I'll play this at the very end of my talk. And what time is it? Um, we've still got some time. But I want to just give you a, a sense of this. Whoops. Okay. I'm going to just go to, <clears throat> to this video for one moment, just to give you a flavor of the choir so you can see the sense of community. If you ever find yourself stuck in the middle of the sea, I'll sail away to find you. play a little bit more of that at the end if you'd like. Um, but I wanted to show you, um, this is the Voices in Motion website. And there's a number of videos on it at the bottom here. The one that you just heard was Count on Me. We've got Try a Little Kindness. During COVID, it was just really important to be able to continue singing. And although it's not an ideal on Zoom, um, we were able to, to keep things going. And uh, let me share with you one other excerpt. This was early in the concert. Um, it's one of the songs that has the most meaning to the choir. We sing it at the end of every concert. I've always believed in the power of music and the arts, especially in later life. They're what give life meaning. We started this choir in January of 2018 in order to provide people with dementia and their family caregivers a way to get together. Um, we partnered with local high schools and started this choir with a professional director so that people could come together and have a bit of joy and, and also just the kind of support that they need to participate in a meaningful activity. Music's a little bit magical, um, but there are other things that people like to do and not everyone's a singer. So I became very interested in starting a memory cafe, Victoria, that would focus on arts more generally and provide just, a, I, I say it here, a joyful creative space for people with memory loss and their family care partners. And I've been leading this memory cafe for a year and a half now. I don't really have any funding. I've tried to gather a little bit of data, but um, really it's just about trying to create a, a dementia friendly space for people. I've been partnering with Sandwich Parks and we get together with a group of dyads, about six of them every week. Um, during COVID, we did this online. We had to limit the number of people to seven dyads because online it's um, challenging, you know, the number of screens that you can look at and interact with. Online doesn't work as well because people can't interact in the same ways. Um, so I've been really pleased that this last 12 weeks, we've been able to meet in person, 
at a community center. Um, we've done some outings um, and uh, we're just creating opportunities for them to come in, relax, do an activity. We've had activities like drumming, um, story creation, poetry. Um, it's a 12 week program. It was initially online, but now it's in person. And when it was online, it was only an hour a week, but now we're up to two hours a week at the community center. Um, I often bring in um, professionally led people. Um, I've been using some UVic students in music and in art most recently because I don't have funding to, to pay someone. We've actually even done some improv, which worked incredibly well. And I think it's activities like that, like we're demonstrating to care partners how they can interact in meaningful ways with the person living with memory loss. Like they're picking up particular skills. Like they're learning that you don't have to reorient someone to the day or ask them questions about a picture tied to who is that, which the person may not remember. But to say, you know, to point out like when you're looking at a particular scene, you know, how does this make you feel? What do you think is happening here? These kinds of open-ended questions that allow people to not have to try to remember something, but to be able to tell and share whatever they want with whoever's listening. Um, again, it's intergenerational. I have students who are volunteering. Um, the older adults really enjoy that. The students bring a lot of energy in. And again, they're learning a lot about dementia. So some of the quotes that we had from the Memory Cafe, um, people want to get to know people who are like them, others who have dementia. And so this caregiver, um, her quote, really tapped into that. And caregivers also want opportunities to meet other care partners who really understand, you know, and, and can help support them as they're going through similar things. Um, one of the care partners said, you know, in the moment, her mom had pretty severe dementia and she didn't remember um, what happened afterwards. So it was pretty hard. It's one of the challenges of research on people living with memory loss is that um, you can't tap into it. Like even an hour later, they may have forgotten what they were doing. They know that they still feel really good and they're happy. Um, but this daughter said in the moment, it was like she was her old self, laughing, engaging, getting to tell her stories. And it felt good for the, her daughter to see her that way again. Um, the students have told me that they love getting to hear the participants. Um, they get to hear about the participants' weeks, what they've been doing, hearing about their interests. They have vibrant personalities. I feel as though a lot of individuals in my generation don't recognize this enough. They assume elderly individuals are the same, that they all have boring hobbies and stories. Um, and she concluded by saying, what I love about the Memory Cafe, I'm reminded of how untrue that is. These individuals are uniquely human. They all have stories to share, a sense of humor and people they've loved and lost. And remembering this is in my opinion, is of vital importance. Um, so I feel like the students really gain a lot. Um, the students were really helpful in the Zoom because the following week, the student, we would ask the students to create like a poster to share that captured what people had contributed to a conversation and to the activity that we were leading. So this one activity, we had um, a music therapist there talking about the music child and they created a song together. And this poster just sort of captures it in a very creative way you know, some of the things that people contributed. And so under blue, it was a blues song they created. Singing in the Memory Cafe Blues, I wish everyone out there could be in our shoes. What else would you want to choose? What better thing is there to do? It's always good to do this without shoes. It's no time to snooze. Thanks to everyone, there goes my blues. So that was kind of the song that they, parts of the song that they ended up creating. But they get acknowledged for what they've contributed. I think the posters remind them that, hey, this is what we did last week. We had a mask making event where we mailed out our supplies and everybody made masks and talked about what that meant. And then we had kind of a, a dance live music activity that was led by Kairos Alive. Um, one of the things about doing things online is you can, you can bring in people from anywhere to, to lead activities. So that was one of the positive things of online. A few weeks ago, we had a drumming cafe and people really liked that. We brought in drums and people got to pick out different patterns and beats and music is always pretty magical. Uh, a few weeks ago, we did a painting session and people did not want to leave. <laughs> they wanted to keep painting and it's not like 
they had necessarily thought that they had the ability to paint, but we created a way for them to be inspired and to just start picking up some paints and create some things. And this past week, we went on a field trip to um, the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, and we had a private facilitated tour. And then afterwards, I got to lead an activity called um, Haka Zome, which is the ancient art of Japanese flower smashing. And since it was spring, I had everyone bring in flowers and a little hammer, and I had these lemon cloths, and we smashed flowers. And for the most part, I think some of it turned out really well, <laughs> and people enjoyed kind of smashing their flowers onto these cloths. Um, recently, I've released something called the Call the Mind podcast. Um, during, the, um, <clears throat> during the pandemic, um, I asked a few mm -hmm. caregivers if they would consider doing some audio diaries. And we ended up with a four-part podcast series called that we ended up calling Call to Mind. And my goal was to, to capture some of the voices of care partners and their family members and the personal stories to increase empathy. Um, I wanted to shift the narrative away from one of tragedy um, and decline and caregiver burden and fear to more balanced stories that aren't, aren't that, that balance the, the challenges along with love, tenderness, and joy. And um, so this is a, uh, I'm gonna share with you just a quick little excerpt from one of these. This is Call to Mind, a podcast series from the University of Victoria, audio stories of love and memory loss. Beautiful bunny. Lovely, isn't it? Oh, it's a beautiful day. I had a wonderful day. after people with dementia because um, there's certain things that you learn along the way and one of them is you take every minute of respite in this podcast series People living with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia record audio diaries and conversations about their lives during the pandemic. I'm your host, Deborah Sheets, a nursing professor and researcher with the Institute on Aging. Okay, so we ended up with four of these four of these audio stories, and um, now I'm working on developing a a guide to help families capture some of these stories on their own. And I'm hopeful that more people will start recording themselves. Um, not necessarily for public release or anything, but because I think we often don't think of that. And I wish I could hear my dad's voice again and hear him telling some of his funny stories. Like it's so easy to do with, um, we just did these recordings with a phone app and they came out quite well. Now they were edited, so they're, they're pretty polished at this point. Um, I love this picture of Brenda and her mom, Dot. Dot was a hundred years old and was living in long-term care. And for her birthday, Brenda had to wave at her. She was up on the fifth floor of a long-term care facility. She was losing weight. She was declining. And Brenda made the, the decision just to take her out of long-term care and bring her home. So this was for her 101st birthday. <laughs> and uh, her last year of life was a lot better, I have to say. And my client, oops, okay. Okay, so next steps. I just wanted to share with you some of the things I'm working on. I think there's a real gap um, between how we help people, like between the medical and the social models of care that we have. Um, on the one hand, we've got people who get diagnosed with dementia and there's been an effort recently um, to, to bring people to help rec to recognize the social needs of people as well as the medical needs. So there's been this whole effort to do social prescribing, which is well and good, uh, for people who are older and who have become socially isolated to try to give them 
a healthcare navigator to identify how they can become more engaged in their community. The issue I have with this is that very little attention has been paid to people living with dementia. So they haven't really been, although some of the people in social prescribing programs have memory loss, they're often supported in terms of just being connected, like if they like gardening, a community gardening program. But the people in the community gardening program may not be informed about dementia. They may not, there may not be a, necessarily a sense of community and welcoming. So we need to think about like how we do things like social prescribing. How do we ensure that people with dementia are included in this and in ways that where they feel welcomed rather than stigmatized because they're different or they can't remember this or that or they need more support. Um, so I've been thinking about how we can bridge sort of the healthcare world, which I've existed in, where we have things like, you know, people are diagnosed with an illness and then you bring in physical therapy and social workers and, um, and occupational therapy and speech therapy. And then there's this whole world of arts and recreation and leisure in which you've got people working, doing really important work, but they aren't licensed. So they're not included in the healthcare team necessarily. You've got art therapists and music therapists and recreation therapy. And I don't even like calling these things therapy because honestly it medicalizes them. And it's really just about having a rich and meaningful life, right? So I've been trying within Victoria to develop something called Momentia Victoria. It's patterned on Momentia Seattle which is really a bit of a, a movement um, to, to create and show the possibilities of activities that people with dementia can engage in. Um, so Momentia Victoria is about creating a one-stop website and it's just, um, it's still underway, it's still being developed, um, but I'm partnering with like the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria with the Royal BC Museum, with the Bateman Gallery, with Parts and Rec, Parks and Recreation, which offers gentle walking, gentle walks, um, to try to try to provide opportunities, make it more easy for people to understand like what kinds of things they might do, and for them to connect with others who have dementia or are care partners, um, to to go out for a walk with others who who understand. Um, so it's this very much grassroots movement. It's aimed at empowering people with memory loss to remain connected and active in their communities. Um, and we're trying to celebrate the strengths and the voices of people living with dementia. And it's, you know, it's a easy to maintain kind of website. Um, I think, you know, I'm gonna continue to develop this going forward. Um, we've got sections for like music, dance and theater. So we've got the Voices in Motion Society up on that. Ballet Victoria offers a tea for tutu. Um, which is free that people can go to. And I think it's about creating almost a meetup for people living with dementia and care partners, a way for them to easily connect with one another. So I mentioned um, social prescribing, which is this um, growing interest in referring older adults, um, not necessarily with dementia, to non-clinical resources to reduce social isolation. And I've proposed a project called RX Connect for people with dementia to get a similar kind of support. But rather than activities, I think people with dementia need to need help and support finding communities of care, like the Voices in Motion Choir or the Minds in Motion, which is a fitness um, program for people living with dementia and their care partners, or a memory cafe. People living with dementia have different interests. Some of them want to do singing, some want to do arts, some want to just like socialize or go for walks or meet up for coffee. Um, I like the idea of programs in general though, because it does provide an opportunity for community to be created. So within the context of a memory cafe, you can offer people options of things that they might wanna do together. Um, I'm gonna to be partnering with the Seniors Outpatient Clinic and the Primary Care Memory Clinic here in Victoria, so that when people are diagnosed with dementia, we then bridge them over to, to some of the other supports that are available. And I'm hoping that we'll be able to start this program in fall. Um, we're gonna look at things like purpose and meaning, what, what activities people find most meaningful, the extent to which this increases social connections, reduces loneliness, um, depression, and caregiver distress. Um, and then reconnect. Um, 
I've got a planning committee and we're trying to look at how we can create pathways to dementia informed programs. And um, in particular, like we don't wanna, we wanna help people become self-sufficient. We want them to be able to develop self-efficacy so that they can identify uh, what social programs are out there. And I think having a one-stop website is helpful, but you know, you want to give people navigation skills initially with support, but then you want them to be able to do it themselves. And by empowering them to self-advocacy, um, I think that's the way that that we have to we have to be thinking going forward. Like it's about initial supports and then how do we teach people to do this for themselves? Um, so I've been fortunate to have support from a number of different organizations. So I want to thank all of them um, for allowing me to do something that I find so meaningful and so important. And here's my information.